7. Matthew 11, verse 7. In the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse number 7, the Bible says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? Question mark. What did you go to see? A reed shaken in the wilderness? Question mark. So the Lord was asking them, what did you go out to see? You had to have had a purpose for going out there. For John the Baptist was baptizing people out in the wilderness. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the word of God. We're so thankful that it leads us still today and guides us. And we're asking for guidance in this last hour of the church. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. The church, God, uh, religion, no matter what religion that you might believe in or where people might have started out. I know our family started out in the Catholic doctrine, the Catholic church, where they teach the doctrine of the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost being three separate persons. And as a child, I was baptized by a sprinkle um, in the Catholic Church. And later on, as we began to look at the Word of God, and as my dad, you know, although we were Catholic, my dad at the same time was an alcoholic. And so drinking and, and all that was going on Friday and Saturday, and Sunday, they might go to church, they might not. Um, so that was their lifestyle. Although they considered themselves Catholic, uh, very seldom did they go to church. But if they ever did go, they would go to the Catholic church in Kingsville, Texas. But my dad got to a place where he realized, you know, I am wasting all our money, all our resources. My dad had a good job, wasting all of that and uh, he would go out on Friday after payday and would cash his check in a, in a tavern. And once you get that cash and you begin to drink, then you, buy, you begin to buy your friends drinks. And next thing you know, you're drunk and everybody's taking advantage of you. And by the time you leave, sometimes if people are not careful, I know my dad, by the time he got home on Saturday sometime early in the wee hours of the morning, he was so drunk. A lot of times he don't even remember how he got home. But he realized that his religion, the, the, the doctrine that he was in was not helping him. He tried to get help from the cardinal. One time the cardinal was getting in his car and my dad went around the back where he knew the cardinal had visited the, their church and he knew that they would load him up in the back of the church into a special vehicle that would take him to the airport or wherever he needed to go. And so my dad snuck around the back of the Catholic Church and waited when the cardinal came through. Um, he, he hollered out, sir, I need help. I need help. I can't stop the alcohol, the problems. And all the cardinal says, you need to go see a counselor somewhere and get some help. That was the help that he got. So he realized that that his religion, his walk with God was not doing it. So he found a, a, a man that he worked with, and I've told you a story about Jesse. Jesse was a black Baptist man that worked with dad and saw the condition of dad. And, and he would tell him, Augie, you, you, need to, you need to go to church, man. You need to go to a place that, that prays for you, and, and you need to let Jesus in your heart. And, and the simple thought of, of, of the Baptist doctrine, you know, accept Jesus in your heart was what they believed in. And so that was better than, than nothing. And, but my dad got to the place where he did not want to hear. He did not want to hear any more about Jesus or church. Uh, the cardinal had let him down. The Catholic church had let him down. And he was no more open for God or for anything. So he told Jesse, Jesse, I don't, I don't want to hear that anymore, man. He said, I, I just don't want to hear it. And Jesse said, okay, Augie, I'll leave you alone. I'll leave you alone. I understand we're not supposed to push this gospel on anybody. But I just want you to know, Augie. If you ever get to the place where you're, you're, you're at the end, 
You, you've reached the end. And there is no more hope in anything or anyone. Remember, there is a God. He's for real. And He can help you. And that kind of, yeah, okay, okay. So dad went on and he continued to live in his lifestyle of, you know, drinking and fighting all the time, getting in fights in the bars. And finally, one day in his stupor, drunk, he stole a vehicle. And they chased him down, put him in jail. And he knew he was facing at least three years in prison. And mom and I came to see him at the jail before the the. The, the, the trial, I was only two years old and I don't remember, but mom said dad's testimony was that I was barefooted. My jeans were all tore up, my pants that I had. Mom was nothing but skin and bones. And uh, come up to see him. He could see us through, his, uh, through the bars in the second floor, I believe it was, looking out, watching us come to see him. And something inside of him finally broke. Finally... You know, sometimes we have to get to the end of our rope where we let go and cry out for help. God, I can't help myself. I, I, I need some, some, some help. And my dad did not know anything about religion or anything, but he, he that night after we went to see him, the next night, would, the next day would be his sentencing. He would go before the judge. And he knelt down there in his, in his cell room, and he began to cry. Because when you're in jail, it's a place to sober up. Because they don't bring you beer, they don't bring you drugs. And he sobered up. And in his uh, human understanding, he could understand, Lord, I, I have nowhere to turn. Tomorrow is court day. And I know what they're going to say. Three years. And so he cried. Big, big old tears started coming down his face. And he began to cry out to God. God, if you're real. And he remembered the words of Jesse. If you get to the place where no one can help you, remember God is real. And he says, God, if you're real, just give me one more chance. That's all I ask, one more chance. All the other cellmates, all the other inmates there begin to laugh. He says, only the girls cry, man, what are you doing? But he was beyond being embarrassed. He was beyond his pride. He was beyond his human understanding. He was at the end of his rope. And if there was a God, that was the only hope that he had. The next day, he goes before the judge, and the judge looked at mom, and he looked at me, and the judge said, Augie, I don't know why. I don't know why. He said, I've got your record here in front of me. I've got enough here to send you for at least three years. But I'm going to tell you what. He said, I'm going to give you one more chance. And the, the words that he prayed that night came back to his mind that he has got, just give me one more chance. Aren't you glad for a God that can hear us? He literally hears us. And the judge said, I'm going to give you one more chance because of that woman and because of that boy. But if you ever come before me again, he said, I'm going to throw the book at you. My dad didn't waste any time. He went home that, that evening, shaved, cleaned up. He hadn't shaved or got a haircut in, in, in months. He was all bushy-haired and bearded. and He just had given up on life. He shaved and got cleaned Sunday morning early. He got his nicest clothes that he had. And across the street is the funniest thing because right across the street was the church. Our help for the Rios family was just on the other side of the church, on the other side of the street. And he walked across the street, completely surrendered, completely. Before he walked through the door of the church house, he was already surrendered. I give up, Lord. I can't help myself. He walked in through the door and made his way up to the altar. As soon as he hit the altar, they hadn't asked for altar call or the preacher had even preached or any songs had been sung. He didn't know protocol. All he knew is that there's a church, and they say that at church there is a God that can hear you. And he walked up there, and all the ladies, there was mo mostly ladies in the church except for the pastor. He's a young Mexican guy from uh, California. Couldn't hardly speak any Spanish at all. He could just speak English. And he, they, in their simple way, came and they put their hands on my dad and began to pray. And that day, he went down an alcoholic. He went down a man bound by sin and bound by the thoughts of the war where he had fought and almost lost his life. He got shot. 
but while he was at war, he would pray the simplest prayers that he needed to pray. God, my, my dad never knew a mom. My dad never knew his grandmother died also that tried to raise him. She died at, when he was at the age of five years old. He never knew, and he told us, you know, growing up, he would tell us, he says, you know, I never knew the love of a mother. I never knew the hug that a mother can give a son and encouragement. He said, I never knew that. It was just me and my dad growing up in the woods in, in Texas. And, and so he would pray, God, all I want to do is meet my wife, and I want to meet my, my children. And, and if you give me grandchildren, oh, God, that would be great. And he would pray this in the foxhole, bombs falling everywhere. But, you know, God can hear us. Right. And God says, you know what, I'm going to make a way for you. He made a way for us. Obviously, right? I'm here. <laughs> he got out of the military, had problems with alcohol, but at the end, God kept this end of the bargain. He met a, a, a beautiful woman that married him, had eight children. I was in the middle. That's why I'm so humble, because I was so <laughs> in the middle. But I had five sisters and two brothers. My two brothers have gone on to, to, to their eternal destination. My dad is also dead and gone. But my thought this evening is when the Lord saw the multitude that had gone out into the wilderness to see John, to be baptized of John, John baptized them unto repentance. But Jesus was wanting to know why, what made you go out there? And I think the, the question is that God is asking us why did you come here today? Why did you come to church today? Why? I'll never forget that the day, and I've told you this story umpteen million times, the day that we were so broke, we were being Christians, we were going to church, we were everywhere we'd go, we were migrant workers, everywhere we would go in Colorado, Nebraska, uh, Michigan, wherever we would go, God would always find us a church and we would go. And mom and dad always kept us in church. But mom had noticed one thing about the churches that we would go to. That although they had come out of the Catholic church, they were still going to a church that believed that God was three persons. And they were baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And she realized that those are not names. Those are just titles. And so when, when she noticed that they were baptized in the assemblies of God, the pastor said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And mom had understood in the Bible that everyone that, that she read about in the Bible, after that John had baptized them unto repentance, all the baptisms after that Jesus had died and resurrected, were all done in the name of Jesus. And she asked Dad, why? Why do they continue to baptize us in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? And Dad said, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't understand. My, they were both new converts, and they read the Bible. Everybody in the Bible that was ever baptized was always baptized in Jesus' name. And so they didn't know that history, that it was years after Jesus had resurrected and had ascended, and the disciples now were dead. All the apostles had died and had gone on. And the church began to go into apostate. The church began to go into a, a dark place because of persecution. And, and that's where the, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity was birthed. Because people began to be ashamed of the name. The government at the time said, you can continue to have church. You can continue with your religion. You can continue to do the same things you do. Just don't do it in the name. And they got rid of the name. But the Bible says neither is there salvation in any other name. For there is no other name given among men by the which we must be saved. And so mom and dad didn't know history. They did not know. They were not educated. But one day, and it seems like coincidence. You know what coincidence means? It means you're just Lottie Dodden. And you look down and there's a $10 bill. Whoa. You found a $10 bill. 
But for that $10 bill that you found, that means that somebody had to. But it was a coincidence that that person lost the $10 bill. And a coincidence, you happened to be the first person. I don't like finding wallets, Brother Raymar, because if you find a wallet, it's got a name, then you got to take it back to the person. I like just finding cash. I'll never forget the story. Brother Tony was driving down the road, and he was praying, God, you know, our, our, our car bill's coming up, and, and I, I don't know how we're going to. we got a little bit of the payment. We don't have all the payment. Could you help us, Lord? And he's driving. He looked over to the side. And he saw what looked like a dollar bill. He pulled over, got out of his car, went over there and picked that up, and it was a $100 bill. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and he started walking. There's another $100 bill. He just kept on picking. I don't know how many $100 bills he picked. Had his hand full. Of, nobody else was stopping, so that's fine. They're all mine. There was no wallet. There was nothing. And uh, Brother Tony, you know, he's a pastor of Gainesville. And if, if there's a pastor that I would feel like I can trust you to get on, on YouTube or Facebook and listen to him if he's on every Sunday morning, I would recommend the Pentecostals of Gainesville. This morning he preached a fabulous, fabulous message. And, and uh, my wife almost jumped for shout for joy because when Brother Tony gave the title of the lesson, he said, look at your neighbor and say, man, you are weird. And so all the church members had to turn around and look at their neighbor and say, man, you are weird. And said, so the title of my message is, we're all weird. And my wife goes like, oh, my word, I can't believe. I said, what? He said, yesterday when I was coming back from uh, Bradenton, he said, I saw a Jeep, and in the back of the Jeep it says, don't lose your weirdness. And brother, you, you got to hear that message. If you, get, if you get a chance tonight, go home and watch the Pentecostals of Gainesville Sunday morning, this morning, a beautiful message, how we all got problems. The Bible says we all have sinned. And when we come to church, sometimes we think, we're, I don't know if some people think that we're a, a step higher than anybody else. No. We're all sinners saved by grace. And when we say saved by grace, it's to God be the glory. And so here we were, uh, migrant workers, and it seemed like a coincidence that, that we just ran out of money. No more gas money, no more food money, nothing. And, 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 and we were sleeping under trucks, and, and my dad saw and looked across the street, and there was a church, full gospel tabernacle. And he prayed, Lord, give us a job and give us some money and a place to put in my family tonight and tomorrow. I promise you I'll go to that church. And, and so a man came by, a, a farmer came by and went straight to dad. There was other people there, other Mexican people that were all sleeping in their cars and stuff, looking for work. But the man got out of his vehicle and went, man, it seems like a coincidence. But now that I look back, it was God. God was bringing things to happen. The man walked up to my dad and says, you need a job? And dad says, ah, man, I need a job. And he said, uh, you need some money? He says, we're broke. I spent my dollar fifty this morning on donuts, and that's all the money we had. He said, okay. He says, um, you need a place to stay, right? And he says, yes, sir. You know, we need a place to stay. And, and at the moment when you're going in the miracle, right, you just think it's just a coincidence. But God is working out all things for our good, saying, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Man, I tell you, I could testify testimony after testimony of how God, at the time of the miracle, it seemed just like another day. It seemed like another moment, but God was at work. We loaded up our cars. We followed the farmer to the farm out there and, and uh, settled into little houses. Mom and dad in one and us kids in the other. And in the morning, dad woke up and says, Mama... He said, I promise God that if he give us a place to stay, you know, dad didn't say give us a mansion. He didn't say give us a two-story house. Just give us a place to stay. Okay, that's all you want, Rios. That's all I'll give you. Just a place to stay. Little houses smaller than this room. And all of us kids were sleeping in one little room, and mom and dad across the yard were sleeping in their little bungalow. And, and mom and dad woke up Sunday morning, and dad says, you know, I promised God that if he give me a job, he give me a place to stay, that we'd go to that church and see what God has got for us. They went to church, and, and the preacher was preaching, and he said something about baptism in Jesus' name. And mom couldn't speak English a whole lot, but she understood that. Hmm. And she elbowed dad. See, that's what I was talking about. 
And Dad says, well, I don't know. I'll ask him. So after service, the pastor, Brother Ball, came, shaking everybody's hand, walked up to this Mexican couple, my mom and dad. They were there by themselves, shook their hands, and, and, and said, so good to have you. And it was unusual for us because we weren't used to white people being nice to us. And, you know, just back in the day, back in the 60s and, and, and 50s, there wasn't a whole lot of mixing going on. But these people were being real nice to mom and dad. And Pastor Ball says, so good to have you um, and come back anytime. And my dad says, sir, you know, I, I've got this question. And Brother Ball said, yeah, sure. He says, in your study this morning, in your Bible study, you mentioned something about baptism in Jesus' name. Could you explain that? And he says, because we used to be Catholic and they sprinkled us and then we got into the, into the assemblies of God and they submerged us, which, you know, that was better. But they, they did it in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Brother Ball says, oh, I'd be glad to explain that to you. He says, do you guys speak Spanish? And my dad says, yeah, I speak English and Spanish. My wife only speaks Spanish. He says, well, I'll explain it to you in Spanish. Here's this white-headed, uh, white-faced, blue-eyed man saying, I'll explain it to you in Spanish. He said, I used to be a missionary to Cuba before Fidel Castro kicked us all out. He said, I'll, I, I'm fluent in Spanish. So he bricked up his Bible and began to show them how that, when Jesus is going through all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the what? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, 19. But he said in the name, en el nombre, no en los nombres, no en los títulos, sino que en el nombre. And he said when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of of Jesus for the remission of your sins and you shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many of you remember the story of the day of Pentecost where the Bible says, and there suddenly appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. Right before that said, and, and, and the Holy Ghost filled the house where they were sitting. Remember? And it became like a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Sister Rios, I always thought that they were all just like, mm. and then all of a sudden, through the door came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it began to blow around. That is, my son in law was preaching this morning, Victory Tabernacle in Tampa. We were watching online. He began to explain it wasn't a wind like, like the wind that you hear trees, it was the all of a sudden. The saints of God began to worship. He said, begin to worship, and it sounded like a, a sound of a rushing mighty wind. See, and I, and I told my wife, you know, her and I grew up in this thing. And to us, that's normal. Everybody clapping, everybody shouting, saying, getting behind the pastors who praise the Lord. And, and some people began to speak in tongues. We grew up in that. We were so used to it. When I was a little kid, that's all we heard. We'd go to sleep because services would go to 11 o'clock. What? Yeah, 12 o'clock. Oh, Pastor, surely not. One o'clock. Sometimes we had to pick up a kid that got the Holy Ghost that night. I had to pick him up from the altar. I remember those nights. Kids speaking in tongues. Put him in the back seat of the car, speaking in tongues. Drive all the way home. Unload the kids sitting in the, in the bed, speaking in tongues. What was that? That was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It was the Holy Ghost blowing. It doesn't do any good for these four walls to get the Holy Ghost. It doesn't do any good for wind to come from the, from the trees outside. But I tell you what does good is when the saints of God begin to worship God. When God begins to settle in and people begin to get changed. And Brother Tony this morning done, done a wonderful message, amen, uh, uh, about how we're all weird. How we're all strange. When I look at you, I, I made the mistake, Brother Angelo, uh, of going on Facebook and watching myself preach. You're talking about something weird. I've got such an annoying voice. I do. I, it, it's annoying. I can't believe anybody still comes. You guys are glutton for, for punishment. I don't like my voice. I don't like the way I sound. I don't like the way I move. I don't like anything about me. 
You know what I do like, though? I like the message that I preach because we get into the Word of God and we preach the Word of God. It might not sound good. It might not sound eloquent. But if it's in the Word of God, we want to hear it. We want to preach it. So Jesus asked the people, what went out ye to see? And there's a lot of speculation as to what it meant, a reed shaken in the wind. And I began to try to find out some kind of reference as to what that meant. And I went to Google, and I Googled that, and, and some people, uh, Bible scholars, began to explain that a reed shaken in the wind is making reference to people that are wishy-washy, you know, they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Remember in Ephesians, uh, the Bible uh, talks about how not to be uh, um, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it, it simply says that we henceforth be not no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And so some people believe that this is what is making reference about the people of the hour that were supposed to be Jewish people. They had their their laws and their doctrines, and at the same time, while they had their doctrines and their laws that they were supposed to observe, uh, they went out to the wilderness. They heard there's some men out there, and we want to see what that's all about. So some people feel like that's what was going on, and Jesus was warning them, don't be tossed by every wind of doctrine. I'm glad. I am so, so glad that every part of what I believe, the fact that I believe that Jesus is God, manifested in the flesh, it's in the Bible. The Bible says, for in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Emmanuel. This is Old Testament. Isaiah. Emmanuel. Prophesying of this man that would come. He said, Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. And so there is the whole Bible, if you, if you, once you get the revelation of who Jesus is, if you go to the book of Revelation, you will find at the very beginning of the, of the book, it says this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, a revelation has to be making reference to a secret. Something that you didn't know that is going to be revealed in the title of our message today, The Secret Place. The Secret Place. And they found this artwork, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> that is amazing. You can almost feel the Holy Ghost come through that door. <laughs> but remember Nicodemus thought he knew something and he went to Christ and, and, and the night and says, oh, I know that thou art sent from God for no one does the, the works that thou doest. And Jesus said, unless a man is born again of the water and of the spirit, you cannot see. There is no revelation going to be given to you. There is no understanding is going to be given to you. And, 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 Nicodemus said, well, how can I, be a man, go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus explained to him that you've got to be born again of the water and of the spirit. And then as we go into the studying what this means, we understand that we are baptized like a baby that is born from his mother's womb. The water breaks and forthwith comes a little baby. Now that baby, when he comes out, and that water breaks, he has got to breathe or he will not survive. And so baptism in Jesus' name is like that water breaking forth. A new life is getting ready to come up out of there. You go down a sinner, but you come out, washed, your sins completely washed. 
What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How do I get that blood? By water baptism in the name of Jesus. And then you come forth. And we're, we're making a, a baptistry here. We're not all done. We just need the fiberglass on the inside. And we're going to begin to baptize people. And I'll tell you what. We're going to baptize them in the name of Jesus. For the remission of sins. This is why I'm glad that all that I teach. All that I believe. All my salvation is found in the word of God. I, I'm not looking for see what Joseph Smith wrote. I'm not looking what. For, for, for the Mormons or the Jehovah Witness or the Seventh-day Adventists, I go straight to the Word of God and I find my salvation in the Word of God. Straight from the book of Acts and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Ephesians, Colossians, Corinthians, Timothy, Titus, the book of Revelation, Jude. Read all of that. Here's the exciting part. A lot of religions start right there. My religion starts all the way back. All the way back to Adam and Eve. See, from the very beginning where, where the Lord had to take and sacrifice an animal to clothe Adam and Eve, he was already prophesying. There is a, you know, when Abraham took, when was it? Uh, Jacob, was it? No, Abraham took. Isaac took Jacob. A, a, that's right. When Abraham went to sacrifice his son, Jacob, Isaac, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, when he went to sacrifice, right there I find Jesus. Because when, when Abraham had his hand up to, to slay his son Isaac, the Lord stopped him and he said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And the Bible says that there was a ram and a lot of people thought, see, God's, God's provided himself a sacrifice. There, there is a ram that God provided. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he will provide himself a lamb. John the Baptist and all these things are, are secret saints of God. That has taken us to a place. Now, when, when I ask the question, what did you come into the church house for to see? I'm telling you what, you can see a lot of things. But one thing you're not going to be able to see with the natural eyes. One thing you're not going to be able to hear with the natural ears is that secret place. There is a secret place that a lot of people cannot, that they don't find because they only come to the church house to see a reed shaking in the wind. A preacher waving his hands. Somebody identified this reed shaking in the wind. Says John the Baptist, he shook his hands when he preached. They think that's what Jesus was saying. Why did you go out to the wilderness to see a reed shaking in the wind, making it sound like when John the Baptist was preaching, he was just shaking his hands? Well, maybe so. The other place that I find something similar to this in the Old Testament is when uh, when God took the kingdom. From the lineage of David, because Solomon had gone astray, just kept going astray, kept 700 or some concubines and wives, and just giving himself to all kinds of filthiness and stuff. And finally, God came and he took the kingdom from, from, from the lineage of David and gave it to a man named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, the Bible says that he never did the things that God had called him to do. And the Bible said that that he would take away the land that he had promised to the children of Israel. He said, I'm going to take you out of this land of promise, the land that is flowing mi with milk and honey. And I began to, to see how humanity does this over and over. Here we are. We found this nation, uh, a, a brand new, untouched nation called the Americas. And we began to farm. We began to call on the name of the Lord. And we founded everything in God we trust. And God bless America. 
and we gave pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, one nation under God, and, and God began to bless America. And it was in America that my dad was able to find Jesus because there was churches that were preaching. There were preachers that were preaching out of the word of God. But by and by and by and by, we've got a government now that doesn't want anything to do with God. And I see Jeroboam, Jeroboam, you're, you're taking the people of God away from God. You need to get us back to God. And we had a president that was trying to make America great again. And a lot of us were able to read in between the lines when he said, I'm going to make America great again. We knew what that meant, that if America is going to be great, it's because we turn back to God. Because without God, we are no different than Israel. Every time they backslid, they ended up being captive by other people. And God warned them that they were like a reed shaken in the water. And I don't want to be like that. Another example of, of a reed uh, shaken in the wind, another Google thing that they, some guy that has been to the Holy Land, to those regions, he said there is a, uh, there's reeds that grow there, some, some weeds that have a reed and they come up. And in the heat of the day, when it's real hot, those reeds begin to, to bow down. And, and they're almost touching the ground. And when the cool of the evening comes and the wind, the cool winds start blowing, a lot of people from those cities would go out into the wilderness. And that was kind of like a pastime. It, it wasn't HBO, it wasn't TV, it wasn't the movies, but it was something they could do, take their kids and they get out of the city and they go watch these reeds as the, as the wind began to blow. And all of a sudden they cool down and those reeds begin to stand up again and blow in the wind. And, you know, a lot of people, they come to the church. They come to see what's going on. And all they, they can see and all they know about Christianity is the drums and, and the music and, and the guitar and the bass and, and the singing and the harmonies and all that stuff. And, and they want to join the church. Oh, I want to be a part of the choir. I want to be the keyboard player. And some of them have come and done a wonderful job playing drums and playing the bass and playing different things but they never found the secret of the tabernacle. David said, in the secret of thy tabernacle shalt thou hide me. And, and consequently, a lot of people end up backsliding because, you know, playing the drums in church is not going to keep you when the trials come. Playing the keyboard in church, we used to have a, 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 a man who used to play beautifully in our home church and and, and, and everybody would just like, oh, man, he can play. He can really play all kinds of kudos to, to the organ player at, at our home church. But by and by, that organ playing just was not satisfying because, saints of God, there is a secret in the house of God that you got to find for yourself. It's a secret play, place. I've got my, my uh, grandson here, and I, and I can tell you, uh, Angelo, there is a secret place that you need to find for yourself. I can't. I can tell you about this secret place, but I can't take you there. I got my daughter right here, my son-in-law, my wife. I've got my saints here, and, and I, I'm here to tell you that there is a secret place that you can find in the house of God. That is more than the music. It's more than the preacher. It's more than the United Pentecostal Church. It's a secret place. And a lot of us have found it. I found it when I was only six years old. And years went by. I spoke in tongues and I, I fell in love with God. Pastor, are you saying you never sinned since you were six? No, I'm not saying that. The Bible says for all have sinned. This sinful flesh, you're never going to. It's, it's a trick from the devil. To make you think that somehow you can't live for God because... You've got a sinful nature, but I'm telling you what, this sinful nature, it, it takes a back seat to the Holy Ghost nature. Once you find that secret place, once you get the Holy Ghost, now you know what I'm talking about, the secret place. Once you get the Holy Ghost saints of God, you begin to get the power. Nicodemus, if, if you understood what Jesus, woman at the well, remember, if you knew who it was that was standing right here. You would ask of him, what, what was Jesus talking about? That secret place. If you, if you get revelation, 
If you can understand it, two revelations are, are good enough to last you for a lifetime until you get to heaven. Revelation number one is who he is, who Jesus is. Jesus was not a, just a good man. Jesus was not just a prophet. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was a begotten. He was a son that came of the Holy Ghost. He didn't come. He came from the woman, but he was of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was the father of Jesus. Well, man, pastor, you're confusing me. Well, the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost are three that are the same. He who, have seen the who has seen me has seen the father, for I and the father, we are one. Jesus was trying to explain that this is not a Trinitarian God. This is not a triune God. This is a one God that has manifested himself as the Father in creation, as the Son in redemption, and in the Holy Ghost in regeneration. But you will never get regenerated until you get the revelation of who Jesus is. The second revelation, this will humble you. The second revelation is of who you're not. If that doesn't humble you, you just don't have the revelation. And I've said it before. A lot of people think, well, I got to humble myself. So I guess I got to I got to get down here. That's fake humiliation. What, what is another word? A fake. Fake humiliation. So you're just faking like you're. Oh, I'm being real humble. No. When you humble yourself like that, you're so humble that you're proud of it. I am. Have you ever met those kind of Christians? There's a couple that got saved here, and I try to calm them, calm down, calm down. No, they left here. I'm going somewhere else where they, someplace else where they can show how humble they are. With those people, you can't, you can't laugh. Well, I don't think Jesus would appreciate you laughing. They correct adults. Their children correct adults. The Bible says rebuke not an elder. But these people have gone down to a place where they, they humble themselves. Never got the revelation. They just did it themselves. Oh, I'm going to be a, such a humble person. Those kind of Christians make me sick. You don't need to lower yourself to be more humble. You just need a revelation. You just need a revelation who you're not. I'm not God. I can't save anyone. I can't even save myself. That's why Sister Rio said, you got to work out your own salvation. See, salvation is already there. Jesus already paid the price. And it's nothing that I can do to save myself except go through the, go work out. Repent. That's something that I, I'm working it out. And be baptized. I'm working it out. That's the plan. And then I get the Holy Ghost. But at the end of the Holy Ghost, if you don't get the revelation that you are nothing without him, you will always be a proud, humble person. And always trying to correct everybody else. I don't need to correct anybody else. I just need to keep my eyes on Jesus. Somebody asks me a question, I go to the Word. You know, somebody asks you a question, you don't need to, well, I, this is what I do. Oh, give me a break. I don't want to know what you did. A lot of people say, a lot of people say, well, I know the Bible says, but I think I'm like, that really makes me sick. That just, I think that's a lukewarmness, the Bible says. You need a hot or cold. You just know too much to be lukewarm. And you want to give your opinion. I don't want to hear your opinion. I want to hear what thus saith the word of God. You know, right now, right now, there's a lot of things. Listen to me, saints of God. There's a lot of false doctrine where you can do anything you want. Even if it's against God's word, all you got to do is, at the end of it, put, because God loves us all. That's all you got to put at the end. 
I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a drug dealer, but, but God loves us all. I, I, I cheat on my wife, but that, you know, God loves us all. I'm a woman, but I want to be a man. And that's okay because God loves us all. Where is the deception? Because the love of God is not going to save anyone. For God so loved how many? Is the whole world going to be saved? We need to wake up, saints of God, that the only thing that is going to save us is obedience to the word of God. Not the love of God. By God's love, he made a way for us. But if you don't walk the way, then you're going to be lost. The way is that way, and you keep on walking this way, you'll never make it. You need a preacher that will tell you. You need a revelation that without God, you're lost. You see, this revelation is beautiful because this revelation will come to everybody that opens their heart to Jesus Christ. It's a revelation that will change you from self-sufficient to I can't do anything without him. Without him, I can do nothing. To with him, I can do all things through Christ, through Christ. And you know, when something happens to Christ, be the glory. That's why I've told you, don't ask me to write a book about how to build a church in Immokalee. I don't know how many people have come through this church. I know we're a small number now, but I'm, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that we've baptized in an old horse tank that is out there. And I, I, I can see in my mind's eye, there's a whole bunch more that are coming that we're going to baptize in Jesus' name. They're on their way. They're on their way. They're waiting for me to finish the tank here. So, But at the end, don't ask me to write a book because it was not I that did it. I had a I had a man of God one time that I just cringed because he did take a small church with about 15 people and he built it up, beautiful building, and, and, and hundreds and thousands of people, beautiful orchestra, music, everything. And then he took another church and, and tried to build that church for the Lord. And he stood behind the pulpit. He said, I know how to build a church. I know how to build a church. This church was only 150, maybe 200 people that could seat 500 people. And he came to help the church, but he made a mistake because he looked back at what happened at the other church and how God used him to build that church up into the thousands of saints in a small community. But to think that you did that, that's a bad mistake. We got plans on building right here on the other side. If you can see what I can see, we're going to have a nice uh, church on, on the other side. God is already working all these things in our mind. And, and, and so when that is all completed and I'm done with my work here, I don't want anybody to say, well, look what Brother Rios did. I, I want people to say, look what God did. Look what the Lord has done from my heart, from my heart. To God said, God, if you use me in the magnitude already, I, I can say, thank you, Jesus. There's two churches that are that are going on in, in Lehigh right now that came from here. And God told me to send them over there. And there was during the COVID. So that worked out great. The Lord said, OK, government, you want social distancing? We'll social distance these people, send them over there. Remember when persecution hit the early church? The Bible says they scattered, but everywhere they went, they lit it on fire. They were changing the world. So when we come to the church, thanks to God, let's all stand. When we come to church, let's not come just looking at what our eyes can see. Come on, let us look for that secret place. For in the secret of thy tabernacle, David said, you shall hide me in your pavilion. This is hard times, there's no doubt. I was watching a clip of Edward uh, Snowden. He got evicted from this. He had to flee the country because Mr. Snowden was involved with all the computers, with all the secrets of our government. He was deep. I'm talking about as deep as you can go with all the emails and all that stuff. And he met a couple of journalists, and he gave them the information that the government is spying on all of us. Even if you have your phone turned off, 
even if you have your iPad turned off. They can turn on your cameras. They can turn on your microphone. They can hear everything you're saying. And Mr. Snowden was taken back by, by what was going on because they weren't only spying on the enemy. They were spying on Americans. Our government is spying on us. And he said, this is not right. This is illegal. They're not, they shouldn't be doing this. And more than likely, they were spying on things that American people are doing in, in their private bathing Whatever goes in your bedroom, all that, they were spying on all of that. He perverted sick people in the government. And he ousted them all. And they went after him, and he fled. And he ended up in Russia trying to buy a ticket to go to South America where he knew he could find asylum. But next thing you know, they revoked his visa and everything. And, and he said, we're living in such a dangerous time because he knows deep, a lot deeper than what you and I know about the computers and what they're controlling, what they're planning. And, and all, he knew all that stuff. They had given him clearance. And everything was fine until he found out that they were spying on Americans, and that's illegal. But they try to uh, uh, prosecute him. They just can't get a hold of him. He, right now he's in Russia. Um, Putin allowed him to stay there. But he said something that really caught my attention. He says, we're living in an era. We're living in a time where feelings are worth more than facts. Feelings are worth more to people than the facts. These people that are in government right now, they, they just want it to ascend to as high as they could go. That's what they had in their mind. They just want to be president, vice president. They just want to be in power. What are you going to do when you get there? Well, we don't know. We just want to be up there. And you can tell that they don't even know what they want. They don't know what, what we're going to do. We got a problem at the border. Nah, that's not a real problem. They're hiding. Because why? Because they don't have any answers. They don't know what to do. But they wanted the power. And so the facts to them don't matter. It's the feeling that I am exalted. Saints of God, we got to have the opposite. We at the church, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the word of God. Not what grandma said, not what grandpa. Let's look at the word of God. How am I going to be saved? I am going to be saved like Peter said. Repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. And you shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. God, we pray today that the secret of the tabernacle of God, that David only could dream of, he never got to experience it except for in revelation of what you showed him. He was able, oh God, to see this thing. And now we are at the end of this beautiful revelation. And the church is about ready to be raptured. And I pray that everybody that wants to go, we're not taking anybody that don't want to go. People that's got the agendas and things of this world that are in love with this world. We would dare not kidnap them, Lord. But those that want to go, help us to find that secret place in thee that the storms come, trials come, and nothing moves us because we find a secret place. We find a closet somewhere and we take it to you in prayer. In the secret of thy tabernacle, you're going to hide us, O oh God. Dismiss us from this place, never from your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen.